All right, let's talk about food reactions. And the number one food reaction that everyone loves to think about is the one that is responsible for the lovely flavor of nicely browned toast, of a well-fried donut, and of bacon. I am talking, of course, about the Maillard reaction. The Maillard reaction is not actually just one reaction uh, between one thing and one other thing. No, it is an entire class of chemical reactions which has so many component parts that in fact we haven't characterized them all yet and we probably never will. In general, what is happening in a Maillard reaction is you have amino acids from proteins, so lots of protein here, but you'd be surprised, enough protein here for that to matter, reacting with a sugar. And well, you knew there was a sugar here, but it's here too. And when the proteins react with the sugars at uh, particular temperatures and compositions, um, specifically, usually, you know, what do, what do these things have in common? If you think about that, well, when you get stuff brown uh, from cooking, not from enzymatic degradation, but when you get stuff brown from cooking, it's usually at a really high temperature. You are up above the temperature where water boils. Now, when water is mixed with solutes, it boils at a higher temperature, and the more other stuff is in the mix, the higher the temperature the water boils at. Therefore, even though water boils at uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees C, you will still find appreciable water present as the temperature goes up, right up until you get in the range of 300, at which point you get to the point where water is at, at, at very, very, very small concentration by mass. Uh, and you will notice coincidentally, or perhaps not coincidentally, that is right around the temperature where you find the Maillard reaction really taking off. So a characteristic of things that have undergone the Maillard reaction is they are typically quite dry. And this would be uh, why, uh, you know, if you boil, oh, I don't know, a hot dog, that's boiling a hot dog right there, you don't get the browned bits on the outside that you would get if you took that same hot dog and had it over a grill or a fire, right? Those two things result in different outcomes for the exterior of the hot dog, uh, specifically because you have uh, no, no Maillard reaction here and the potential for plenty of Maillard reaction there. I also just want to mention a little piece of food and chemistry history, uh, Maillard, uh, which um, I know some people will just turn into Mallard. That's fine. Uh, go for it. It's a French name. It's uh, the name of the chemist that first identified this set of um, chemical reactions. Uh, back in 1912, he published about this. So uh, Monsieur or uh, Professor Louis Camille Maillard uh, in 1912 uh, first published on this reaction and its importance to food. So when the Maillard reaction occurs, you get thousands of compounds. And exactly what compounds you get depend on what the proteins were that you started with, what the sugars were that you started with, what temperatures you got to, how long you left the food at those temperatures, what other compounds that might also react uh, with the resulting products may be present. So it's complicated, but we can group things in a few ways, uh, which I find to be kind of interesting. So I'm gonna share some of the uh, groups, the families of chemicals we typically see. So first, let's talk about colors. When we think about things that have undergone the Maillard reaction, like the piece of toast, uh, you think brown, right? And this color comes from melanoidins, which is a class of chemicals that have color to them, as you might be able to tell from their name. So if you look at this and you go back to um, our original chemistry lectures, you'll see, for example, down here, 
is something that looks like a piece of a protein. It's got a couple of uh, amine, uh, amino acid looking things to it. And then up at this end, there's a bunch of ring-ish things that look like they may once have had something to do with sugar, but maybe not. And so this is, in general, the, the kind of chemical that occurs that gives us that nice brown flavor. And you'll also see, actually looking around here, there are some places where we have R groups that mean that uh, R, you will remember from chemistry perhaps, means substitute some other thing in here. So these, uh, while it looks like this is a picture of three different chemicals, it's actually a picture of thousands of different chemicals that kind of have the same general sort of shape. And you'll see that these are kind of big chemicals and that's why they, um, or that's part of why they might have an influence on the color of what we're looking at. These coloring compounds also uh, have other biological activity. Uh, so if you look at the literature, some of these act as antioxidants. Some of these can act as antimicrobial. Um, and on and on. So that's cool. Let's talk about flavors and aromas. And I've used up all of this space, so we'll go to the next page. For flavors and aromas, let's refer to a web page, the uh, compound chemistry, which is, or compound interest, which uh, is found here at compoundchemistry.com. And they're a really helpful infographic on the Maillard reaction. You can see the full citation right here. Um, what I want you to look at in particular is the flavors. And these flavors are found in everything from beer to uh, roast turkey, but in varying degrees and amounts. So you'll notice there's things like the furanones, which is this happy little ring with a, uh, with a few oxygens stuck into it, uh, where you get kind of sweet caramel and eventually burnt, whereas their uh, friend, something that, if you're not all that into chemistry, might look really similar, but is a little bit different. The furans uh, give you uh, the meaty end of that caramelized flavor. So this whole suite of compounds are things that we uh, develop, and to a greater or lesser degree, as we are browning foods. And you'll notice some of these are actually also listed as tasting burnt. Uh, you'll probably have experienced in your life as those get to a greater degree of concentration, things taste more and more burnt, whereas you might have stuff be, uh, have just a touch of that and it actually be pleasant. Now, um, you may be thinking some of these look a little bit, I don't know, um, if you're not used to chemistry, you might find some of these scary looking. And that is, a, uh, in some sense, a little bit true in that many of these chemicals, in fact, lots and lots and lots of the things we eat, you would not want to have um, drink a gallon of in its pure chemical form. Uh, but there are some compounds developed during the Maillard reaction that are in fact uh, not so nice even at lower concentrations, and we'll talk about those on the next page. So here is uh, one of the principal uh, nasty chemicals that may arise as a result of the Maillard reaction. Uh, this happy little molecule over here is called acrylamide, and it is uh, on its own uh, poisonous. That's true. And uh, it is potentially, potentially carcinogenic. Uh, I don't want to get into this here because this isn't a epidemiology uh, physiology class. However, uh, just briefly, it is a little bit tricky, especially in food, to tease out the extent to which uh, very low levels of long-term exposure of a particular key thing uh, lead to certain outcomes, especially ones that don't happen instantly. So identifying if something all by itself is toxic, that's pretty straightforward if things act quickly. Um, if something uh, that you have at parts per million over the course of your entire lifetime is uh, likewise 
not so great, much harder to tease out. But anyway, acrylamide uh, by itself is known, if you just had this chemical sitting by itself, uh, it is toxic. Um, but, uh, and you can see how it's got some pieces to it that look like they could easily come off of the Maillard reaction, where we have a bit that looks a lot like it came off of a protein, and maybe some other bits that could potentially have, have come off of sugars. And um, this can be a monomer for a polymer that is quite, you know, is safe. You know, so polyacrylamide does uh, interesting things and is useful, um, and therefore has a very different chemical action than the uh, monomer all by itself. There is a recommendation from uh, the United Nations and the World Health Organization that uh, nobody eat more than 0.5 micrograms of this stuff per their own kilogram of body weight per day. And that is uh, way higher, like maybe 500 times higher than normal intake. So uh, in most cases, from a dietary perspective, this should not be that much of a concern. Uh, but it is an excellent example of the fact that when you have thousands of compounds arising from a single reaction, it is quite likely that some of them will be things that when consumed in excess or in their pure state uh, are harmful. Um, it's just going to happen when you throw chemistry, <laughs> throw the spaghetti of chemistry at the wall and just eat whatever comes out. And it is something that humans have been doing since humans started cooking food. So this is not uh, necessarily a new uh, compound to be introduced in trace amounts into the diet.